Okay, JB, we've done a number of uh, episodes of getting this car out of its dusty parking place that it lived in for a while. Yes. Pretty pretty good long while, and now it's it's in its uh, beautiful splendor. It's clean and beautiful, and it's running right. Uh, so now it's time to get a little bit of the history of this car. Tell me what is, we know it's a 1937 Buick Century. Give me a little background on this car as far as you know, how it was designed, how it came about, why it became uh, kind of a cool car in its time. It's still a cool car now. But what's the background on this car? Uh, I'll get, firstly, um, Buick needed an image car uh, going into the mid-30s. They, uh, they felt that uh, performance was one of, the, one of the ways that they could get ahead of Ford. Ford had come out with the flathead V8, of course, and that dropped the flag for performance. So Buick, having been very much interested in performance cars, decided they would have their own performance car. So in 1935, or thereabouts, they started planning for what they called uh, the Century, which was a car that c they could guarantee would go 100 miles an hour. And it, that, was a, that was an enormous uh, kind of a promise and a task at that in that era certainly uh, I don't know of any other car that guaranteed that in, anywhere in the world frankly so it was a very uh, bold move and of course they had to prove that they could in fact do it so they took what they had to work with which was a small car that uh, meaning the uh, special series and then they uh, decided to put the Roadmaster motor uh, into the special effectively creating what was then the very first hot rod coming from a factory. And uh, they were pretty well convinced that they could get the horsepower up with this straight eight because it's a very powerful engine. This is the bigger version, but in a bigger car, of course, it wasn't nearly as fast. When you brought it down to a lighter weight car, uh, of course, the performance went up dramatically and uh, it, it would in fact go 100 miles an hour. And that was uh, hard to put yourself in that context but that was a big deal, and it, it, it really devastated the Ford people because they really had nothing that would go that fast. Mm -hmm. um, now remember, this is 35, so the Zephyr hasn't come along yet, and of course they had their own plans uh, to take care of that. But that hadn't come to the fore yet, so Buick kind of got the drop on them in terms of performance, and uh, it was a very, very limited number of them sold. It was kind of an anachronism in the sense that people that had money to buy a Buick uh, which was considerably more than than the middle of the road cars. Um, you know, they they weren't really that interested in performance. They wanted quality. They wanted ride. You know, they wanted to steer, and and uh, they weren't much concerned about mileage in those days. But but they wanted a very high quality car that would last. They didn't buy cars normally for the short term. They would buy them and keep them for three and four years, and they had to be uh, reasonably convinced the car would make it that long without a lot of service and a lot of mechanical problems. So Buick stressed quality very early on and was very good at uh, quality control. Um, they didn't introduce things that, that didn't work and were not sorted out except for in 1937. Um, <clears throat> they decided to come out with an automatic transmission, which would, was also very forward thinking in, in, at that time. And the, the, the transmission worked okay, it was kind of clunky, and uh, wasn't particularly well thought out, and it wasn't that easy to operate. So the public rejected it pretty much, and they ended up taking them all out and getting rid of them. So that was a, but that was kind of indicative of Buick's attitude. We're gonna lead, we're not gonna follow. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're gonna lead by example and, and do things well. And when the transmission didn't work, they just called all, all the people up and said, bring them back in, we'll change it, no expense to you. Well. And, uh, and they did that. Some of those automatic transmissions survive, but very few of them. But that was the kind of mentality at Buick. And, and so my, my racing background in a variety of different kinds of racing uh, led me to Buicks pretty early on because they were high performance cars uh, from the factory. And this, of course, is a perfect example. Uh, the 36 century convertible was also sold in very limited numbers. Very few of those survive to this day. Um, 37s also are very rare. Uh, you, you'll find a, a coupe, you can find uh, specials, you can find all kinds of things. But this special combination of, 
of attributes was, was very rare. They only built about 600 of them and mm -hmm. virtually none of them survived uh, so, World War II. So how did you come across this one? A friend of mine bought it. Uh, it had been in a, in a warehouse since new is the way I heard it. And the man bought it and stuck it in the warehouse and never really used it. And a friend of mine bought it in Los Angeles. And uh, the minute I saw it, I realized I was in trouble because it was in primer. It wasn't, it was sitting up on blocks, but you could just see what it could be. I mean, it wasn't, didn't take a visionary to figure that out. And I pestered him and pestered him and he knew how rare they were. He wasn't about to turn loose of it, except that finally he just got tired of hearing me whine and cry and gnash my teeth. So he just said, okay, 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 fine, I'll sell it to you. And then he put a price on it that would hope that would hopefully would discourage me and it did uh, except that I went out and saved my pennies and and did what I had to do and I scraped up the money and I don't How think long ago was that it was about 25 30 years ago okay he's a really interesting cat and uh, uh, I think he sold it to me I don't think he would have sold it to anyone else we talked about it subsequently to that and I think he's kind of upset that he did it Mm -hmm. I think it was one of the cars that he probably thought he ought to, should have hung on to. Yeah. Now you say it was in primer, um, so I understand yes. you were going to do the paint job or whatever body work. Right. What was it? What condition was the interior and the mechanicals? It was in excellent shape. Uh, it had been in a warehouse since new, so it really had no rust on it. Um, mm -hmm. Everything was there. He had it started to restore it, as I recall it, and then just pushed it outside. And, uh, in the, and, and, you know, in Los Angeles, you can get away with that for a time. Mm -hmm. But it started to kind of go downhill. Mm -hmm. It was very complete. Um, I had to buy virtually nothing for it. And it was low miles, so the engine wasn't worn out. But I wanted to go a step further in terms of performance. So I took it to a, an engine builder in Los Angeles who was well known for building straight eights and getting a lot of horsepower out of them. Okay. And he's the one that built the engine for it. Okay. So the mechanicals were, were in good condition. Um, you needed to do body work, pick, pick the color, you know, and turn it into an, uh, like a real car that you'd enjoy driving. Sure. So tell, walk me through the story of, of picking a color and, and creating a car and, and how long did it take? And just give me that story on, on fixing this thing up. Well, I think in, you know, if you do a car properly, it takes a long time. And so that gives you a a, a, enough time to consider what color this car would look best in, 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 your, in your frame of reference. In other mm -hmm. words, what would you love to see every time you see it again? And certain cars have uh, certain colors that, that work very well with them. They have also have colors that don't work worth a damn. Mm -hmm. And you have to, your, your unfortunate responsibility as the owner of the car, or fortunate, is to pick a color that complements the car, not one that's outlandish or uh, just fit, suits your fancy one weekend. You see a chartreuse one going down the street, so you decide you're going to paint yours that color. It, people that do that, it doesn't matter who they are, they rue the day. Yeah. Because once you get into that process, there's no backing up. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that have to be done to paint and to go to that process. Not to mention the expense of the paint anymore, which is thousands and thousands of dollars. Right. So you really have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, because it's a very personal decision, um, but you have to make it, I don't make it for myself, I make it for the car. Certain cars have certain colors that bring out their essence and certain colors just don't. They flatten right. out, they, they're they dark and oppressive, or yeah. they don't show off the body lines. Well, and also, I'm thinking of that color with respect to the chrome. Yes. There is a pile of chrome yeah. on this car. Yeah. I can't even imagine how many pieces of chrome there are. So and clearly, and you want a color that goes with the chrome. Was all that chrome there when you bought it? Oh yeah, um, <clears throat> the, the cars didn't really get really over chromed until the '50s. Yeah, and, and in the early '40s. But this car is is a kind of a middle of the road in terms of that. Okay. The, the reason it's so noteworthy is that, is that the placement of the chrome. Okay. And the color and the way they, they relate to one another, they they make each other pop, as they say. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this car. Uh, pull a 58 Buick in here, it has a tenth the amount of chrome, literally, but yeah. it, it, the way it's, it's applied, mm -hmm. I mean, this, is, this was where Harley Earl, who was the head of GM Design, sh shown he knew which guys to pick to do 
that sort of thing. And they were all incredibly bright and, and talented guys. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, Edsel Ford had Bob Gregor, they had a, a staff of probably 10 times as many mm -hmm. talented artists and designers. So, right. And, and the chrome and how it was applied and how much or how little had a lot to do with its overall appearance. But the mm -hmm. color was what really drove. Right. And it, of course, the color di dictates the color of the interior and the top. So and a lot you of cars pick the color, you know, obviously you have a red interior and kind of a right. tan colored top. Yep, that's an unusual combination. But if you notice the top that we picked has red piping on it to pull right. the thing together. Mm -hmm. It's an unusual combination. And it, this, this was my antique red period. And everything I did was antique red. It didn't matter what color the car was. Um, antique red leather, and it was available. I'm not sure if it's even available any longer, but it was mm. very much a 30s kind of an idea. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful model, kind of a textured uh, red with a lot of black flecking in it. And it's just it's just a really neat color. Mm -hmm. And it blends really well with a lot of other colors and, and, and complements them. Okay. So I decided to go red, red, which is a little bit over the top on the red thing. But uh, it just works in this car. Yeah. And then the top kind of relieves the stress of looking at all that red. Mm. But then I put the red piping back in it. So. <laughs> right. Now that was a probably five years coming up with that combination. This is not something you do overnight. Right. Now, uh, going back to the driving of it, we talked about the automatic transmission right. and, and the rear axle. What are the other significant uh, changes you've made or even, you know, just enjoyment kind of changes you've made? Well, we wanted it to be spiritually correct with the period. We didn't want it to look like a hot rod or a mm -hmm. custom. Because to me, uh, you, you cross over the line and then you've you've really missed the whole point of the, of the exercise. Right. You know, hot rod is a hot rod, and a lot of people, or a custom is a custom, and an original car is an original car. This is the original car that has some updates on it. That's how you would describe it. Right. Okay. I, it's the way I would describe it. It has an automatic transmission. It has a late model rear end because you can't use a torque tube and an automatic transmission. Well, right. we didn't know at the time you could. Let's right. put it that way. Okay. There is a way to do that. We subsequently uh, discovered, but there... We didn't know about it at the time, and we wanted to, we wanted to experiment with the Turbo 350 because it's a good transmission. It's very durable, shifts really smoothly, and it doesn't rob a lot of power. So, what about braking? Do you have power brakes or the old original mechanicals, uh, or we I guess power, or hydraulic have, brakes, right? We have we have power hydraulic okay. brakes. You know, Buick had hydraulic brakes way before Ford did. Okay. So even though Ford came out with hydraulic brakes in '39, this is the '37. It has hydraulic brakes. So okay. They work perfectly well. Um, we we didn't feel like a booster was necessary. We may actually end up putting a booster on it just to give a little, make it stop a little quicker. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say that that's one of the places we still need to do some work because the brakes are probably if the brakes are just glazed, if the, if the shoes are just glazed, and that happens sometimes when the car sits a long time. Mm -hmm. um, then all we got to do is put new brake shoes on it. But right now it's not stopping to my liking. I got you. And um, so we're going to be looking at that. Um, we wanted to put uh, a brake booster on it and a, and a hydraulic brake system. But we didn't want to put it out where you could see it on the firewall. So that's one of the reasons why we put it under the dash. Okay. And a company called Kugel makes a, what they call a swinging brake system where everything, the brakes and all of the ugly stuff is under the dash okay, rather than cool. out in the engine compartment where it's, to me, it's obnoxious looking. Right. And it's out of character with the 30s right. car. Right. You, you see this old straight eight with yeah. the Everything is very correct and, and then you this big, you know, right. goofy wart looking thing hanging on the <laughs> right. on the firewall. It just didn't work. So we, right. we put it, it was a lot of engineering. Um, mm -hmm. When you take the, uh, the, the standard transmission out of a Buick, you lose the mount for all the pedals because right. that's where they're mounted on just ironically so we had to recreate all of that geometry right in a, in a in a in short i would just simply tell you i'd never do it again <laughs> you fought uh, your way to the end on this one though, yeah huh? it was just way too much work yeah but i we figured it out and if anybody's interested we can certainly tell them how to do right. it right cut Very through good. some of the the, the r d stuff that we had to go through mm -hmm. All right, and of course we've shown in the video, but maybe someone's watching this video first, right. that you uh, really, for practical reasons, you did a lot to the fuel system yes. to, to make this kind of a car that 
because I think probably the fuel system and the, the pump that came on the engine originally right. was maybe the toughest thing about an occasional use car. Yeah. Uh, that, that is probably a smart modification for a lot of old cars. Yeah, now there now you have to check with your the, the brand of car you have and the people you're buying it from, but they have gotten the message that alcohol-based fuels destroy rubber. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of them have converted their diaphragms to alcohol resistant so that it's not a problem on all fuel pumps, mechanical fuel pumps. Almost all, I'm sure all electric fuel pumps by this point are all alcohol resistant. Right. And they just have to work better. Mm -hmm. They're easy to replace, they're easy to buy, they're not expensive, and uh, irrespective of the fact that they're not original, uh, you have to ask yourself, do you want to be original on the side of the road, or do you want to be in the <laughs> middle of the road with something that's aftermarket? Yeah, enjoying then, a cruise down Enjoying highway, yourself, yeah. yeah it, you you got to stop with the original stuff. It's just, it's just there's, a, there's a limit uh, to the, the, the silliness you want to put up with, and I'm, I'm certainly... Right. Uh, I like one thing you said uh, some time back, you said, your a, a philosophy that might be a good guide is if you can unbolt it and bolt it back on later yes. and and modify it in the middle and keep the old parts you know there's really nothing wrong with that to enjoy the car yeah i think that's the difference between stepping over the line mm -hmm. and and ruining a car and modifying it right because if you can put it back the way you found it original mm -hmm. with with a minimum amount of simply just bolting things back on right there's it's no some, harm it's, done at some point uh, some subsequent owner, you know, may decide he wants to go back to the original way it was built. And some mm -hmm. of these cars are so valuable. Right. You can imagine uh, some of these cars gain in value because they are original. Some of them gain in value because they are not original. And mm -hmm. so that's a, Zephyrs are one that really hits both marks. Uh huh. It, it doesn't, there, there is a purest original, everything is original kind of a, a, a following. But more and more, what you're seeing is people don't want to just, you know, sit them in the living room and stare at them and, and brag about them. They want to actually get them out and drive them on the freeway or on the highway. Mm -hmm. and, and that means that the safety has to be, has to be appropriate for a car going a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, the brakes have to be better. And you want to get there. Right. You'd like to actually get there, you know. <laughs> I realize that, as one lady said, uh, that owning one of these cars is an adventure. But it doesn't want to be adventure every time you drive it. Right. So that gets old, yeah, as exactly. you well know. That's right. And uh, Well, real good. Well, um, okay, we've covered the styling. You've got the drivetrain. And, and I guess there's one more thing I was going to ask you. Um, it seems to me that the ride height may not be quite original. Yeah, when we, when we, put, we put a uh, 65 Riviera rear end in this car, okay. which is a Buick rear end in a Buick. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the reason we did that was because we had a conventional drive shaft which made it up to the back of the conventional transmission automatic sure. it also uh, meant that we could uh, drop the car down a little bit without dropping it on the floor right but bring it down a little bit which makes it ride a little better mm -hmm. um, and it allowed us to use the original buick wheels because this is a buick rear end mm -hmm. even though it's 30 years later it still had the same still bolt matched pattern up. yeah so well. now instead of having some goofy you know mag mag wheel or something which I have no idea why you do that, but people mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. That's okay, mm -hmm. um, sort of. <laughs> Maybe um, not your personal taste. No, it is. Um, but it's an unbolt bolt-on thing. Exactly. So Thank you. Fine. Yes, you can do that. Yeah. But you know, to have the original wheels on it. Kind of cool. The thing I love to do is drive this to a Buick meet. I had a friend that used to do that. He had a Packard that was modified, and he'd drive up to a Packard meet, and you could not tell, mm. other than it sat a little lower and it had a rumble to it. You know. Mm -hmm. And he'd go up to these. It was a beautiful car. Yeah. And you can do the same thing with this car. You roll up and they kind of don't, they, the wheels are stocked. It looks a little different, but it's a little different. Why. They can't yeah. quite figure out what it is. We even put a shifter on the floor to suggest the old three speed. The, the floor uh, shifter, yeah. yeah uh, standard. What about the front? Did you need to lower the front to match when you lowered the back a little bit? How, how did that work out? Do you know? Yeah, yeah, it's a tiny bit. Remember, we didn't lower it that much. We only right. lowered it about two inches. But you can, you can see it if you're a Buick guy. Once yeah. you see a, a stock 37, you know, you need a ladder to get in them. Uh, yeah. And I, I just didn't think that that was the way that car should be. If you look really at a cool. European car in the mid 30s, this mm -hmm. is the way they look. Yeah. They're sitting down, they're long, they're low, they're bad looking. Yeah. And uh, if you stick them up in the air, they, there's something goofy about it. Yeah. Know, it just doesn't work. Oh, this is beautiful. Thanks for sharing it with us. It's yeah. really great. It's been a great.
car. It's a great cruiser, great yes, going for is. a ride. Yes, it is. All right. Puts a lot of smiles on a lot of faces. That's it really right. does. <laughs>